and put it and fall off the chair. Many of you will know um, I, don't, I don't do standing, just like many of you. Move these down a bit because I'm also short. So this will also be of interest to young people who are thinking of heading to university and higher education as well because I've got some information that might be useful to you as well. So as I said, my name's Tanya Tira Oro. Um, I've got my two um, young adults um, have EDS, ADHD, ADD, and um, one has gender dysphoria as well. So first of all, the most important things that you do for your child yourself. So first of all, explain the condition to them um, in easy ways that they can understand. Um, and I don't know if you know stickman communications. They make these really uh, little kind of laminated cards and really as it's stickmancommunications.co.uk. Some really good resources that you can use um, for your, yourself, your children, um, everybody. Teach them how to pace. That's something I've had to learn for myself and something I'm trying to teach my, my own um, young adults, which is really difficult when you're a child because you just want to go and, you know, do your stuff. Um, but it will help them feel in control of, of their own destinies if they can understand what, you know, what will have a bigger impact than, than some other things. Um, and it will help them see the connection as well. So help them learn to listen to what their body is telling them. So, um, and also consider their diet. Um, something I found myself is that giving up meat really improved my digestion. Um, and for my eldest son, when I first took him for his ADHD diagnosis, um, the pediatrician said, so, so what, what does he drink? I said, well, I've been a tooth kind, because I'm a good mum. And he gave me a little smile and said, actually, most of the kids with ADHD are walking here um, drink Ribena tooth kind, and it's the salicylates in the Ribena in the black current that send them um, hyperactive. So um, actually, salicylates is they're they're in really healthy foods as well. So um, you may need to do a bit of research to see what may be um, working or not working for your child. Um, help them learning mindfulness skills. So some schools teach this these days. It's a really big thing in England, I know, in the mental health agenda, in the PHSE, um, to be teaching um, mental health skills. There's also a lot of books for children as well. And something I use, and maybe you could help with your children, are, are called binaural tones, which is you have to wear headphones, and it's one frequency in one ear, one in another ear, and it makes a third frequency, which can help create um, changes within the brain while you're listening to it. Um, and there are some for concentration, some for sleep, some for pain. Um, the website I use is called hemi-sync.com. Um, and they've got lots that you can buy. There's also free ones on YouTube as well and on Spotify. Um, teach your children to keep up their own fluids, um, to keep a bottle of water with them at school as well and, and get permission from the teachers to say that it's really important that they always have this full bottle of water that they can, they can keep their fluids topped up with. Because this is hard for grown-ups as well. So more things to help. Um, give them the tools to explain the condition to other people. Again, the stick man cards, but like keywords such as, you know, I feel dizzy, I dislocate, joint pain, things that they can use to communicate it with without having to go into a really detailed explanation because it's quite a difficult condition to explain, isn't it? Especially as um, earlier they said that, you know, some days you feel okay and some days you don't feel okay and, you know, teachers who don't understand might think that no matter what you say to them, they might think, well, you know, you're just putting it on or whatever. So um, you have to be their advocate as well. Um, and try not to do too much for them, something that I actually did myself with my youngest, and I'm now having to, at the age of 20, um, yeah, they're all autistic, but I have to do their shopping online for them. So I'm trying to teach them how to do those things for themselves because I let them, I, I didn't do it when they were younger because they were not very well. And I just thought, oh, let him, leave him, leave him, you know. And, uh, but I should have made the extra effort. So if you can learn from my mistakes, you know, please do. And help them see what they can do. My youngest, uh, he's at, now studying esports, uh, a degree, which is it's not sports, but it's gaming, the business of gaming. So that's something that, you know, they can do 
as a career without having to move around a lot, and it plays to their interests. Um, and crafts and so on, and things like that, that they, that they can do for themselves, that give them a self-esteem and, and a feeling of self-worth, which is really, really critical. And teach them and yourself about online safety. Um, there is CEOPS, and you think you, know, you think you know, it's called websites. Don't assume that because they're young, they know it all, because they don't. So, um, you know, the, there are ways that you can uh, pass on websites to them, they can look for themselves. There are websites that are written in a way that, that children will want to read as well, rather than listening to their mother or their dad telling them, just be careful online. So, um, yes, yeah, so there there, the, both those websites have sections, particularly for children and young people. Um, and something that's not on there, but it's really take care of yourself. You know the saying, put your own oxygen mask on before you help anybody else? Because if you've passed out, you can't help your child. So um, be kind to yourself. Use those binaural tones yourself. Keep yourself hydrated. Get your own counselling support if that's what you need, because it really is stressful as a parent. Not, maybe you're working, maybe you've, you're, you're not working, and you've got money problems, and you're also trying to care for your child as well. Maybe you've also got um, fibro or a chronic disease yourself. It, it's, you know, it's really stressful because as parents, we naturally want to put our children first because you know, they don't have any choice and we're the grown-ups. Uh, and you should, but you also should make sure that you take care of yourself. Now, your child at school, really important, find the right school. You know, it might not be the school down the end of the road. Um, they all have um, inf um, SEND information, special education needs and disabilities information on their website, so check out those websites. Make sure that that school is gonna be the right school for your child. I mean, they're all supposed to be inclusive, but let's face it, they're not. Um, ask to go in and assess the accessibility aspects yourself. Because um, you'll see things that they don't understand they, because you know your child. So you will think, that's gonna be really difficult. Um, and I'll ask if they will make those reasonable adjustments that they are legally obliged to make. And if they're like, I don't think I want to do that, then maybe that's not the school you want to think about for your child. Um, although, again, they are supposed to be, but you want them to welcome your child. You want them to nurture your child and give them, the, give them what they deserve. But try and work with the schools. Try and build a positive relationship with them, if you can. Um, it depends entirely on the people within the school, doesn't it? As well as, as, well as yourself. But if, as long as you do your best, then, um, then you know that you've done as much as you can. Um, if primary, if your child is in primary, volunteer to help in school because you will learn a lot. For example, how the children are treated there and how adjustments are made. And if those adjustments are made for, for all the children that need it or just for those parents who can shout the loudest. That make a checklist of how to help your child be safe according to their needs. So write down the symptoms before you go in for a meeting so you don't forget to tell them because they've probably got quite a lot of symptoms. Um, so when you go for that meeting, have the list there. Um, and this can include postural support in class, writing supports, regular breaks, um, extra care for PE. Ask school also to arrange an occupational therapy assessment for your child because they are the experts who can help put those adjustments into place um, and ensure that staff are aware of the condition and the needs and, and that they take you seriously and they don't just think, you know, she's just putting on, oh, there's nothing wrong with the kid or whatever. Um, and I know this happens. So, um, but, you know, go in with all the information that you need so that they, they believe you. And it's sad to have to say that, but um, that is the case. And if all fails, you do have the right to ha home educate. Um, certainly in England, and I think it's the same in other countries, you have the right to home educate. And there are lots of um, resources online. There are lots of um, local groups of people who are home educating their children. And there is an, like, online learning and online schooling as well. The local authority can provide online um, schools for children who can't get there. But explaining that condition is just like your GP isn't an expert in EDS, the school even less so. 
So um, download information, loads of information on the EDS Society that gets more every day and all the other um, charities as well. Ask for it to be circulated to all the staff who come into contact with your child, and that includes the, the dinner ladies and the, the playground monitors and everybody like that. Um, for example, my youngest, um, because he had EDS, he, would, um, he also had Raynaud's. Um, but he wouldn't want to put his coat on when he went outside, of course. And so we had to educate the staff to make sure that when, when they saw him running outside in two degrees without his coat on, they would say, go back inside, you know, you know that you need your coat, you know that you need your gloves. Um, otherwise, you will come back in and you'll be so cold that you won't be able to concentrate for the rest of the lesson. Um, so it was educating them to make sure that they could um, do the things that needed to enable your child to thrive. Um, arrange to meet the school head and the SENCO and the school nurse, if there is one, to, to t explain to them. Because EDS, as everybody knows here, affects everybody in different ways. So, um, and you can say, well, this sometimes happens and it's a good idea to, to try this. Or, you know, if they're feeling dizzy, they don't have to come home. You know, just let them lie down for a few minutes, give them a drink, give them a biscuit. And um, chances are, half an hour later, they may feel well enough to go and get back into the fray of it again. Because sometimes schools are far too be, um, like, um, quick to ring you up and go, can you come and get him? He's obviously not feeling very well. Um, that's actually called an illegal exclusion, um, and it's not allowed. Um, quite often, schools will, will do this if, um, you know, if your child is it's behaving um, not particularly well that day. They'll say, oh, come and get him, because he's, 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 not, uh, he's not managing very well. He needs a time out, or he needs to calm down. Um, they're not allowed to do that. And so take a friend or partner with you to meetings to take notes if needed and leave an email or number where they can contact you and say, please, please do email me, do ring me if you need some advice. I'm here to, to help. I mentioned physical education before. Um, you want them to be active as much as they can. Um, my youngest, um, they went to an all boys school. Um, they did contact sports there. So instead of saying to my youngest, um, you know, you can't do football. They said, why don't you be the referee? So he got to be out on there. He got to be having a little run around, but he wasn't getting you know, stuck in with everybody else. So he was being involved. Um, care with gymnastics. You know, it might be great that you can you know, bend yourself backwards into two, but it's not necessarily good for your, for your child's joints. And again, good hydration. Can't say that enough. Um, allow rest periods when needed to allow pacing. Um, You'll have to explain what pacing is to school um, and why it's important. Um, and sign a note to allow things that, because some, some schools won't even give your child paracetamol unless you've written a note to say that it's okay um, and other pain medication that they have. Um, again, tell them that they will need to move around a bit. They will need to go out to, to the toilet if they've got bladder problems as well. And so that everybody in school is on board. The good posture, um, lumbar cushions, I always have one as well, um, writing slopes, the um, schools should be able to provide these things out of their, their budgets. Um, pencil grips, use of a laptop. Um, for example, my son, who is, um, my youngest who is 20, still cannot write properly. I mean, it, you see him write, he looks like a 12-year-old, um, a 7-year-old, because he's got hypermobile fingers, and it took years for us to figure that out. That actually, you know, there was nothing cognitively an issue. It was because he couldn't hold the pen properly because his fingers were bending and it was hurting. But you know, but he can type to um, hundred words a minute. Um, and as for this is really important if you've got a very big school. Ask for a locker near the classroom um, or give an additional textbook to take home as well. So we've heard about ADHD and autism, and we know all about that. So um, they often bring learning needs as well. So how do you tackle that at school? Um, so autism, inattentive ADD, epilepsy, dyslexia, anxiety, dyspraxia, depression, they all come along with it. So 
Schools have duties, legal duties, to provide education for all their children, um, whether they are in school or whether they are out of school in hospital, whether they are at home because the, their anxiety, because they're, they call it school refusing, it's more likely to be called school phobia, um, attendance phobia, because they've become so anxious because their needs are not being met in school that they cannot now actually go into school, or maybe they're being bullied because of their differences. The school is still legally obliged to provide an education. The local authority is obliged to provide an education for your child. Um, wherever you live, if you look on your Department for Education website, which, where, whichever country you live in, there will be those policies there. Too often schools don't know those policies. So you have to tell them about it and insist that this happens. Um, They've, they've got legal duties to make provision for children with disabilities. So um, in Wales, it's now called additional learning needs. In, in England, it's an education, health and care plan. Um, in Scotland, it's something different. Again, I think it was statementing, but I think they may have recently changed things there. But um, don't wait for the school to apply for it. You apply for it. Because quite often, especially in England, if the school applies for it in their name, you can't appeal if you get turned down. So it needs to be in your name and your child's name. Um, and monitor them. Is the school achievement at odds with what you know your child is capable of? Um, again, using my own youngest as an example, um, July child, best reader in the class, but again, couldn't write properly. What did they do? They put him in the remedial English class. Well, he wouldn't want to go. They had to, some, a child came and said, we had to drag your Joe to the class. And I'm like, what? You had to drag my child? Because he's like, I shouldn't be in this class. He knew he shouldn't be in the class. So instead of supporting his intellectual ability, they thought, you can't write. Put him in the remedial group. Um, I did move him from that school quite soon afterwards. Um, so... Be really mindful of what the school is telling you about your child's ability um, compared to what you actually know, because you're their parent, you know them best. Um, so make sure you're having that conversation with the school. Actually, you know, I don't think you're right. I think, you know, we need to find out what's going on here. Um, we need to get some assessments. So remember, you are the expert in your child. Yes, is it? Now, I've heard about um, FII here. Um, I have got some resources. If anybody is going through that or has been threatened with that, um, I know that there are children who's, um, with EDS who have been taken away from their parents and to care because of un, um, bruises, unexplained bruises, and so on. Um, there are a couple of organisations called parents-protecting-children.org.uk and parentsaccused.co.uk that can help with that. It also happens for children who have an undiagnosed condition. There is a particular very well-known children's hospital um, who is notorious for this as well. Um, but you need to get, if that happens, you get a solicitor and get one straight away. Um, but if you've got concerns about your child's learning, a number of things that you need to do. Gather the information. So speak to the SENCO, find out what they think your child is doing and what they should be doing at that stage. Compare the two along with what you know your child can do and start to build up a little dossier, you know, my child's dossier for education. Um, ask for them to be placed on the SEN register so that um, they are eligible for additional um, delegated funds and additional help. Keep notes of everything. Dates, um, meetings, um, emails, telephone calls, make contemporaneous notes of everything that was said, everything that was promised. Make sure it's all followed up. Um, and if it isn't follow up, go in and say, you know, this is what you said you'd do and it hasn't been done. So, um, and it's not because your school is evil, it's because they've got, you know, a thousand other children and many teachers are not trained in, in special educational needs as they should be. Um, and again, they might not actually believe you with the things you are saying, so keep notes because you will need them later on when you come to apply for statutory help, if, if that's what you need to do. 
Um, ask your child as well, what do they find hard? Not just academically, but physically and emotionally at school. And, you know, are there, what is it that's upsetting them at school? What can you do to help? What do you think, what do they think the school can do to help? You know, just don't have a big session, a one-on-one -on -one with a light on them, so child. But just, you know, as you're walking, as you're driving, when, when you know, your attention is not necessarily focused on your child, you will often get more out of them in, in that way. Um, so request in-school assessments, and most of all, don't be fobbed off if you are told you're imagining things. Because if you think there is something wrong, the chances are there is something wrong. So don't be fobbed off. You've got to go to bat for your child. You've got to be a warrior. So what kind of assessments? So educational psychology. Local authorities will have their own educational psychologists. You can call them into school, um, school to, to do a profile. You can also get a private one, which will cost anything from £500 up. They will do a much better one, much more thorough um, assessment of your child. But you may have problems with um, school letting them in and you may have problems with schools um, doing what is said in there, um, even with their own educational psychology report. Um, CAMS, don't all laugh at once, um, I know that it is um, hellish difficult to get a CAMS appointment. Um, you may just be told he doesn't meet our criteria, because the criteria seems to get worse. If, so my child tried suicide last night, it's, it's not bad enough. It's not bad enough. Um, keep pushing, keep pushing. And don't be, when you do get an appointment, don't just take it as, yeah. I mean, ours, ours try to take my son off his medication in the run-up to his GCSEs. You know, let's not be stupid. So, and she even, when I declined, she even went behind my back to the GP to say, oh, look, you know, I think she's wrong. And I went to my GP, and my GP agreed with me. Um, so, you know, stick to your guns, even if it makes you a pain in the butt, you know your child the best. There will be a school counsellor, hopefully, that they can see. Um, if not, ask them you know, what they can do to help you. Autism outreach team. Read up on the, on the symptoms for ADD and autism and ADHD. And if you think that might be your child, school should be able to bring somebody in to observe your child and write up a report on them. We mentioned OT. Speech and language. They don't have to have a speech impediment to have a speech and language therapy report. It's not just speech, but it's communication and social skills and how the child is interacting within the class and within schools. So um, ask for uh, one of those if you think that maybe your child doesn't have any friends or maybe you know, that they're coming home regularly um, upset because they, that they're being bullied. Or something. Just, so get these, get these assessments in so you understand what's going on. Um, you can ask for extra time in exams, both internal and external, but make sure the school applies in good times because there is a cut-off um, after which they would have to have a really, really good excuse. Um, so you can get these extra, extra time. And use of us, my youngest had a scribe for his English, so they wrote it all down for him, and he still got an A star. Um, if he'd had to write it, you know, there's no way. So, um, or they can use a laptop in school, but again, you need to act urgently um, early on in the year to make sure that these things are put in place for the end of the year. Learn the law. We've said schools have legal duties. It's not doing you a favour. They're not doing your child a favour. You're not asking for more than your child deserves, and you're not taking anything away from any other child before they tell you that. Um, there are laws, as I said, out of school. The law is your friend, so read them. Um, there are support groups as well that can help you um, with those. I've got some links coming up. Um, don't be put off again if you're, they say no, you are your child's best advocate. Appeal, complain, be persistent. Oops. So the resources, our website, if you're in England, specialnewsjungle.com. Contact.org.uk have it for the devolved nations as well. They have, if you go to their website, they've got at the top, there is one for England, one for Wales, and one for Northern Ireland as well. Ipsy, Sossen, they're mainly England. Coram Legal, um, Children Legal Centre will be, um, is across the country. 
and other condition-specific charities for the comorbidities as well. The Education government, um, Department where you live, as I said, and Facebook groups, plenty, plenty of Facebook groups for support, but be careful because some people may tell you things that they think is the truth and isn't necessarily so. Um, you know, do, do um, exercise caution. And there, parents who fight at the tr Send Tribunal or who, um, who appeal to the tribunal or wherever you live or the ombudsman, they win 90% of the time. So it's worth, it's worth going for it. Into adulthood, if you want to go to university or an apprenticeship, now, once your child is 18, you do not have an automatic right to be involved in their life anymore. So you need to think about this ahead of time. Um, if they go to uni, they can, they can give their permission in writing so that the school can speak to you. Um, this happened for us. I was able to order my youngest um, meds at the uni surgery for them because they would never remember to do it. So I was able to do those, those interventions. Um, they can give their permission to the GP to speak to you as well um, and to be able to order meds or to go with them. And there is a legal power of attorney or a deputyship if needed so that you can represent your child, your, your young person, and they're not alone. If you're a student, um, disabled students allowance is so much easier to get than um, supported education. Um, if you can get laptops, um, foot rests, laptop rests, um, wedges to make you more comfortable, um, study skills tutor, um, autism skills mentor, counsellors. Um, you have to apply when you apply for your student finance. Um, you say that I have a disability and then they contact you, you have an assessment. Um, in, it was a bit of a shock because we went in there and they said, so what do you need? What, you're, you're just gonna give me something without me having to fight for it? Um, my, my youngest has got 120 hours a year support now, um, which is half of an autism mentor and half of um, study skills, which are absolutely vital if, you're, um, if your child has some kind of disability to help them get through and to help them structure their work so that they can meet those deadlines. Um, and if they have an EHCP, it can be used for an apprenticeship in England. Um, which means that their, their apprenticeship has some legal protection to it in, if you know, there are challenges assess, um, that come along with that. And that's it. So I hope that was useful. It's quite practical, but it is really, you know, I can't stress how, and if you're a parent, you will know how these things are really important for the psychological and emotional health of your child and for you, because getting the right education will set them up for life. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to get through some questions, and if anyone has questions in the room, you do, we'll start with you at the back. Hey. Hi. Um, I have a question about genetic counselling. As I understand it, there's no counselling for hypermobile. Hyper no counselling for hypermobile EDS uh, on the NHS. If, if that's right, uh, can you explain what the reason for that is and, and whether there's any chance of that changing? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> A bit of background. Um, so I've been working in the genetics clinic for uh, 15 or so years now. Um, and when I started, we did used to, in the general genetics clinics, so separate to the specialist service, we did used to accept referrals for hypermobile EDS. But the numbers of those kept increasing, and I think the majority of genetic services now have said there isn't anything that we can offer in genetics departments for people, families with hypermobile EDS. Um, and that is really on the background of seeing a lot of people feeling disappointed with what they got from the service. Um, and you know, we don't have physios attached to our service. We can't uh, manage the condition in genetics. We have no genetic testing to offer in hypermobile EDS at this point in time. Whether that will change in the future, who knows? Um, but that's really the background to you know, a, 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 a sort of a process which has led a, a lot of genetic departments, including Sheffield, where, where I'm based, saying actually no you know we we can't accept these referrals because we can't offer what people want we're going to get them disappointed and actually it's not the right use of nhs resources okay um 
Adoption complications. How does being adopted and not having family history impact diagnosis, particularly when other criteria is borderline for person X, but no parental history of EDS to validate the other assessment criteria bucket? Um, so it is something that we are really used to in genetics um, services is taking into account when people cannot get the family background. It is very normal for us to not have all the information. Even when people um, have, you know, some people come with family histories going back centuries, um, but you're not going to get the right information in even, even in those. So it's, it's something that we're used to working with and we will take into account. And we do what we can do in terms of getting the right diagnosis for somebody on the information that we, we have. Thank you. One for Tanya. Um, children are undiagnosed, um, but highly suspected um, EDS. How do you broach the subject um, to pediatricians and what do you tell school? Um, I feel as though schools think I pander to my children, but I know how much pain they're in. Um, well, as I, as I said in the talk, um, what you need to do is educate them, take the resources um, from websites, print them off. Um, just, you know, you just have to convince them that this is, this is the case, um, this is the information, this is how my child's symptoms match up with the information that's on this, um, on this sheet. What was the other bit of the question? Hang on a second. I've got no memory either. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. Um, basically, um, feeling as though schools think I pander to my children, but they, but you know how much pain they're in. So it's kind of knowing. Yeah, I mean, you just, pain. as I say, you have to. You've got to be a warrior for your child. You have to advocate for them. You, I remember times when I was just exhausted and just feeling humiliated because people didn't believe me and like, uh, and I couldn't do it anymore. And then I would just have to remind myself, it's not about me. It's not about how I feel about something or how embarrassed I am because somebody, didn't, it's about my child and their future. And then I would just get up and do it all again. But I think, you know, join some of those Facebook groups um, and if you, I, any forums to just get that support. Um, you just have to keep at it and at it and at it. There is no magic um, word, there is no magic wand, but um, it's tiring, it's draining, but ultimately your child is worth it. So you've just got to keep going. Thank you, and one for you, Jess. Um, I've been ostracized by family members for trying to educate them about EDS and HSD. What are the best ways to deal with family who deny or are angry at you for mentioning the hereditary nature of EDS to protect them on, or their children? Ooh, that's a good question, isn't it? Mm. Uh, sorry, I've got this wrong. That's a good question. Um, I suppose it's working with your family and um, letting them come to you when they've got questions to some extent because um, sometimes when people don't want to hear things, it's, it's because, you know, it's not relevant to them at that point in time. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I suppose knowing, knowing your family and the best way to communicate to with your family sometimes is giving them a bit of space, um, letting them know that they can ask you questions about a condition when they want to, to know more. Um, it depends on how, what your concerns are for them, really. If you feel like they really need to, to be accessing some help, maybe that can be along the mental health side of things sometimes, um, as much as the, the physical side of things. But um, be, being open with them and um, uh, being there for them to some extent, I suppose. It's not always easy in families. <laughs> Thank you. Question for Natasha. Uh, do you regret finishing your law degree based upon the toll it took on you? Um, if you had known would you have, and you could do it all over, would you have maybe changed your path and your dreams earlier? That's such a good question. And I can't say that I haven't actually asked myself that. But I do think that it was really important that I finished what I started. Um, what I did with it after I, I got my degree, you know, was, was irrelevant, really. I feel like I needed to prove to myself that that was possible. Um, and it was. Uh, whether or not I'm using it now, 
I, I don't know. But what it, what it did was train me to be resilient. And it's easy to think about what EDS takes from you and what you lose, but you do come away with a lot more than some other people might um, in terms of being, you know, your, your determination and your, your resilience through the hard times. And I can now apply that to this new career that I have. Um, and I'm able to get through things that perhaps other people aren't yet able to because my law degree and the difficult times, the difficult time that that, that was, it, it trained me for it. So, in essence, I'm really glad that I did it. Thank you. Uh, question for you, for you again, Jess. Um, what do you suggest when you have a family history of spontaneous organ rupture, but you can't get anyone to refer you to genetics? Uh, speak to your GP. Um, if you have a family history of spontaneous organ rupture, take some information about it to your GP and speak to them. I think most GPs would take notice of that. Um, they should do. You'd hope so. Yeah. And I think that goes back as well to um, what was said earlier, that you do have the right to change your GP. And I think time and time again, people don't realise that. And so if you're not getting anywhere with the GP that you have got, you have the right to change that GP. It's, it's also worth um, thinking about how, where the family history is. So, you know, are we talking you know, quite a number of relatives away from you or directly related to you? It's just worth mentioning that. Um, Tanya, with so many overlapping symptoms and prevalence of misdiagnosis and overlapping diagnosis, how do we really ever know what's going on for us um, when you're thinking about diagnosis and the comorbidities with children? Um, well, you don't, do you? I mean, let's face it. EDS is the most perplexing, infuriating, um, upsetting condition because... It, at times, you know, if, if your child has one particular symptom, sometimes it's quite clear where it's coming from, but other times it could be anything. Uh, and most often, I think it's probably a combination of everything. Um, and I think that you... It just helps to just sometimes take a step back and, and get your head out of it and you know, look at the world around you and take a deep breath, go and do something else for yourself as a parent as well. Um, so that, it, it, because I see parents um, who just become obsessed and ang so angry um, because they can't get what their children need, because they're constantly denied, because there is always things put in the way um, for whatever reason. And, it, it consumes them and, and ruins their life, ruins marriages. Um, so I think my advice would be that you do have to take that step back and make some time for yourself and for your partner um, and your other children as well now and again. Um, however, you know, whatever that means for you, you know, whether it's even just like a walk in the park or some breath, because it doesn't make sense we don't know all the reasons for everything in EDS um, and so it can just drive you mad trying to figure out what's what you just have to accept it you know it is what it is and I'm going to just have to deal with what is in front of me right now um, but remembering all the time the other members of your family as well thank you um, I'd just like to say for anyone that's got, that's a family struggling with children, just our little story, which backs up basically Tanya's and uh, advice, amazing advice, and Natasha's amazing inspirational story. Um, uh, basically, myself and my daughter have both got EDS, and with the help of the amazing Alan Hakim again, who's not here at the moment, but... Um, and various other doctors as well, and my wonderful husband and father, who's really helped us. Um, Lucy had a lot of support through school, um, <coughs> through university. She um, graduated with a first from Birmingham University, and she is now living in the Netherlands independently and holding down a first... Um, a, full-time job in a top international firm so we're really proud of her and just to say there is hope and if you take all the support 
uh, that's available, then you, things can really work out. So just thank wanted you. to say that. And thank you for, for all your advice and stories today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>